Overcoming Vision Problems in Self-Healing with our guest, Mayor Schneider, who directs the School of Self-Healing in San Francisco. Presented to the Holistic Health Class, Holistic Health 380 in the spring 2021 at San Francisco State. It's really an honor to introduce our next speaker who you can see right now is back showing as he is looking down for an instant, I'm making fun of this mayor, uh, to introduce our next speaker who's both a, a great friend, a remarkable clinician, and one whose knowledge at this time is more needed than we even know. In the age of COVID, where so many of us are now captured by computers only looking at screens and afterwards feeling more depressed, more lonely, having more eye problems, Mayor Schneider has a lifetime technological, clinical, self-observational skills and practices by which people can mobilize their health, maintain their vision, and often improve vision. What is more important even is that he is the living example that regardless what happens to you, there's hope at the end of the tunnel. As we work on something, in, we don't know when, what will happen when we work, when we, well, let me say it differently. We don't know when we are sick, what the outcome will be. However, we can keep working at small steps and eventually change may occur. He is the outcome of that. Remember, he was, he was born blind in 1954 with congenital cataracts. I'm sure Mayer may share his whole story, but somehow in his teens, he finally shifted, did all kinds of self-practice and slowly figured out a way to start improving his vision. So now he even has a California's driver's license. He, out of this, he teaches these skills to clients and professionals who have remarkably benefited from it. He's an author of a number of books. I cannot recommend highly enough these books as you are sitting often and working at the computer. His book, Vision for Life, is a must for anybody who, who has any vision problems or wants to stay healthy and be able to see. And his other book, Awakening Your Power of Self-Healing, is broader and applies to many other areas. I'm so honored that Mayer is willing to share his insights to, our, to my students at San Francisco State. So Mayer, such pleasure to have you come. It's wonderful to be here. You know, um, <clears throat> as you are recording this, there's a conference on natural vision improvement. And um, you know Ray Gottlieb, uh, who uh, worked with me when I came to this country. One of the things he's saying that now even a bigger epidemic than COVID is myopia in terms of numbers. So many people get myopia because there's so much closer to the computer and to the smartphone. And for those who don't know what myopia is, it's nearsightedness. Uh, if I interrupt you for a moment, Mayor, I want to emphasize this point because this is, I think, the one of the major contributions you can help everyone with and all the children because we forget that as children are just looking at screens many hours a day, their eyes are only looking at this little distance. And as the eyes mature and develop, that is the only focal length they have. And we can see the harm of this today when we look at the, the young children in Singapore, where now more than 80% of teenagers have to wear glasses. What about uh, South Korea? I heard the last statistics, 94% of them. Remarkable, or sad, so sad. Yeah, but uh, if you go to the Amazon, none of them wears glasses. If you go to the Maoris, none of them wear glasses. Look at the Bedouins in the desert. They don't know how to read. They don't have smartphones. They don't wear glasses. Uh, and <laughs> so if you look in general, uh, more glasses happen as more people were looking from near. And that was already in the last century. And then it became much worse as the computer came and even worse as the smartphone came. And so we really need to learn that there are many things that we're doing that are not really helping us. And this is what I want to talk about. <clears throat> we have several principles of natural vision improvement that if practiced, we could not only not lose our vision, but actually improve our vision. 
And uh, one thing that is very important for me to say, we all need more circulation to the visual system. For me, it's the ninth principle, not the, the first principle, but the ninth principle. And one thing that I want to do with everyone who is watching us, you know, many of you are stooping and are looking at computer, looking at your smartphone, and are tensing the neck. I was looking at people in the Congress, and almost every one of them bends his head. And that includes the past president and this president. I'm asking myself the question, can they think when the head is like this and not enough blood is coming to the head? So the first thing that I want to say to everybody is that we need looser neck. So let's do a little bit of an exercise here. Move your head in rotating motion in both directions. And not much, as if you are creating a coin with your, as if you're uh, drawing a coin with your nose to both directions. And now massage your neck. Move the muscles and really massage your neck in all directions. And massage your head. And this is separate between the skull and the skull. Separate between the skull and the skull to bring more blood to the head. And move your head in rotating motion again, and you may find the head is a bit light. And something that will surprise you, tap here on your belly and say, center, center, center. And center. Center. Tap on, tap on the belly and on the legs and center. say, side, center, side, center, side, and stand up. And sit down and feel how loose your neck is. So when the neck is tight, not enough blood comes to the head. That's the reasons for problems with the eyes when we're young, but it's also a reason for blindness of the eyes when we grow older. Because tight neck leads to lack of blood flow to the visual system, which could lead to glaucoma to a great extent, because glaucoma is, first of all, pressure of the eye that could lead to visual loss. But the pressure comes because there is not enough drainage of fluid from the eye. And if more blood gets into the eye, the eye starts to have good, better irrigation. The second thing, not enough blood comes to the uh, optic nerve. And so if uh, the optic nerve receives circulation, it doesn't decay so quickly. And the third thing is balance use of the eye. So I'll go in a more organized way. I've written in my book, Vision for Life and Awakening Your Power of Self-Healing, the nine principles, which one is deep relaxation of the eyes. And two is uh, adjustment to different light amplitude and frequencies. So many people hide from the sun. We were told by the medical profession that the sun is our enemy. No, it's our friend. There's a way to use the sun that is harmful. There's a way to use the sun that is helpful. Um, you could, you know, apples are very healthy, but if you eat too many of them, you can have some troubles. So what I'm saying is the sun is great, and especially the early sun and the late sun, but even the middle sun is good. And what, Here, what, if I interrupt you for a moment, which I did, I, I want to re-emphasize the point you made that the sun is a friend. We, who evolution, have lived underneath the sun, and the sunlight is necessary for us. And in fact, by being in the sun with your skin, it produces vitamin D, and vitamin D is part of activates our immune system. And in fact, this is even even more relevant today with COVID, where we see that almost all patients who have COVID and get seriously sick, have very low levels of vitamin D. And there's at least some suggestive data that if you have high levels of vitamin D, that's different than if you just get an injection of vitamin D when you are very seriously sick. But if you have an earlier high level of vitamin D, then you're less vulnerable, possibly, to the viral infections and severity of the disease. And you can almost see that perfectly if you even look for the flu. The epidemic of flus and COVID is seasonal in a certain way. It's much worse in the wintertime. So what you're saying about the eyes, 
applies not just to the eyes, to our whole system. Absolutely. And I would like to say more than that, dopamine is being produced also in the eye, something that most people don't know. It's mainly produced, of course, in the brain. And I think that uh, uh, the eye does go through a lot of changes. But if we keep talking about the sun, it's very important for the heart. In the past, Swiss doctors, before there was penicillin, used the sun for wound healing. And sometimes the sun was used for overcoming tuberculosis. So the idea that the sun is only bad for you is kind of 30 years old, and it's proven to be dangerous because it leads to osteoporosis. The more you are away from the sun, the more osteoporosis you have. So there is a balance there. There could be some danger to the skin. On the other hand, some people who never go to the sun also have problems with the skin. So what I want to say is that adaptation to the strong sunlight is very important for the eyes. By the way, it's also important for the heart. It's important for many parts of us. Adaptation. And at the same, I, I'm not, I have nothing against a hat with a visor. People used to be in the shade for millions of years, too. But I'm everything against sunglasses, unless the sun is straight in your eyes. I'm against dark glasses because dark glasses can cause a lot of problems. So uh, to begin with, uh, we need to relax the eyes. Then we need to adapt to the strong sunlight. But we also need to adapt to the dark of the night. It's, it's interesting, uh, there was a book called The End of Night, which I thought was a fantastic book, saying that people vilify the darkness of the night. It's such a wonderful thing. I mean, here in San Francisco, we can hardly see the stars. Sometimes we see some of them. But truly, you have to go to Death Valley uh, and uh, some other desert places if you really want to see the stars. Because the city lights don't allow us to have a real night. And the pituitary gland is so important, it can prevent cancer of all kinds if we activate the pituitary gland. And it is very important for our circadian rhythm. So uh, being able to be in the dark of the night, I'll never forget, I once walked in the uh, park with a group of mine, and one lady said, uh, the darkest, uh, the brightest morning I had uh, ever had was a night walk with Mayor in the park. Because we uh, got used to the light, then we saw too much light, the halo. We, we went in the park where the city does not invest in lights, but the halo of all the lights from the city makes the sky too bright and doesn't allow us to see as many stars as we could otherwise. And so ad adaptation to different light amplitude and frequency is very important. Third, Looking at details. You know, when I was blind, and just to tell you my history, 99% of my lens is scar tissue. 99%. I had five cataract surgeries, and the biggest problem of uh, cataract at birth is that the brain starts to develop uh, visual, visually only at the age of eight weeks. But if then you don't see, the brain erases the whole idea of seeing. In fact, it was discovered uh, by a Bostonian biologist that he would uh, patch uh, baby monkeys uh, and kittens in a critical time of their brain development. And even if the eyes were normal, they would be blind. So when you're born with a defect like cataract, as I was born and my two kids were born, and if your brain cannot see uh, light in a particular time of your, of your brain development, which is eight weeks, you become blind for life. In my generation, doctors did not know that. And I'm really commending them for knowing it later on because my two kids were helped by the surgery that was done on time. They surgically removed the lens um, and then they gave them contact lenses and now glasses. Uh, and their vision developed beautifully, uh, better than anyone else who was born with cataracts, because uh, most kids who are born with cataracts develop 30% vision, except for my kids who are born with cataracts, and they develop um, 
they develop 100% food. And I just want to show you this. This is, uh, this is a normal lens. Yeah. Just hold it there in a moment so we can see it. Okay, good. Yeah, this is a normal lens. This is my lens after five surgeries. Sorry, my lens. And so on that lens, all that what is white is not no basically no signal goes through, and you only get a signal for the little pie shape. Right. So basically, ninety nine percent of my lens does not allow light to go through. Ninety nine percent. Uh, Can I make a let, let me make a comment here? I want to emphasize that. So by the time Mayer was a young child, he was truly blind. He had a one percent vision. And then he developed all these techniques by which he slowly retrained his vision, his brain literally, to perceive differently. Would that be a good way of saying it? Absolutely. Many so, of these, so because many of these, basically there were two reasons for my blindness. And reason number one is what you saw, that uh, they didn't know what to do with the fact that adults who had blindness in my, who had cataract in my time, they would remove the lens, give them glasses, and they would see okay. But kids who were born with cataracts never saw okay. They didn't understand why. So they operated and operated and operated, tried to take parts of the cataract out. The rest of the lens becomes scar tissue. I accused them for absolutely nothing. I mean, that's what they knew. That's what they tried. I'm happy that um, my grandmother was about to remove her eye and put install uh, her eye in my eye. It would not have worked. And thank God the surgeon who was about to do it, unfortunately, died just a couple of days before the surgery. But uh, basically, they didn't understand what they're doing because what sees is not your eyes, your brain. And even with a small piece of lens, and even though I missed the time of brain development that all of you had, which is eight weeks of life, from which you start to see, you see from near, very well from near, from life six inches, and then it goes farther and farther and farther. On eight weeks of life, you develop your visual cortex, and it matured uh, to fantastic vision, better than 2020, 2015, basically, which uh, I would um, show you on the chart. So 2020 uh, is this from uh, 2015, is this from 2015, somebody who sees 2020 uh, has to stand from 15 feet to see the 2015 line. Uh, and so uh, you developed the 2015 at the age of three, but the problem is that reading a lot gets you to decrease your vision with time. And so uh, people become myopic. Uh, the inside of the eye changes shape. The core change shape. The sclera of the eye changes shape. And the vitreous fluid fills in, and so your eyeball becomes longer and longer. And the problems of myopia are many. For one thing, retinal detachment uh, and many others. So what I learned was to look at details. So again, let's return to the principle. Number one, deep relaxation. Number two, uh, adjusting to light frequency, uh, to not be sensitive to the strongest light and to not feel bad at the weakest light. There's one lady who lost 95% of her vision. She came to me from Portugal twice to work with me intensively. She took me to Portugal and arranged a course for me, very effective courses. It was many people in Portugal. People came from all of Europe and even from South America. And we worked on our eyes in their courses. She was not able to live alone and her daughter, at the age of 45, still had to live with her. But after she worked with me, she could cross the street, and light did not hurt her as much as it did when we started. And so it was a wonderful thing. In fact, I think that I've shown uh, in your class a documentary on her and the work we did. But what I want to say is that one of the things that I taught her is to use her periphery. One of the things that you need to learn is to use your central vision and to look at small points without making any effort to see them. Okay, so excuse me, my mayor. Can you 
what do you mean by that? Do you mean I'm looking at my screen at all the small points here? Or, or do you mean I look outside and look at the leaves and the trunks of the trees or the branches? I prefer that by far, you know. I prefer to look at all the leaves and all the whatever consists of branches. But also, when you look at my face, you think that it's all together clear. But truthfully, you look from detail to detail to detail to detail to detail to detail. And you think that you see clear face, but the retina is not built that way. Only one and a half percent of the retina is the macula of the photoreceptors, is the macula. And that macula loops from area to area with sub saccadic movement. And so anything you look at, no matter what, look from detail to detail. We lost curiosity, is number one. We also, because you know, when you go to the supermarket, you don't care about all the cans that are around you. You want to get the can of tomato that you need for that dinner that you're going to pick. So looking at going to supermarkets and looking at uh, details is not compatible, and yet you are mired with details. There's so many details. You cannot be vigilant to them. So you block the tendency to look at details. We also learn not to look too much at each other's faces in order not to uh, offend people and look at their space. Uh, but the result is that we block ourselves from seeing as good as we could. So that's number one. Number two, we need to understand that when we read, we should look at smaller areas, letter by letter by letter, and not look all at once at uh, a big paragraph. And I'm teaching it people because many people lost clarity of vision. And to show you, you know, and um, uh, number eight is what I've seen that some people in State University can still read. But as people become 40, they cannot even have an idea of how this looks like. And I've heard of number nine as well. In ours, we have only number eight. But de detailed vision means that when I look at this W, I'm looking at parts of the W and I go up and down and look at the space. So basically being aware of vision. I mean, it's almost like a Zen concept that I'm present. I'm aware, I'm, I'm looking and not dozing and not looking is a very tough thing for the eyes, but looking is a great, great thing for the eyes. And then the next principle is so one of the exercises, excuse me. So one of the exercises people can do during the day then to keep their vision is to go wherever they're looking every so often, like I'm sitting at my computer right now as you're talking, I could be just looking at your face or I can look out my window for a moment and look at the tree and follow the branches, each branch separately for a moment and then come back to the computer. My preference is that as much as you can look away, as much as you can. And uh, this is something that I'm asking for people who take my workshops uh, on Zoom, that sometimes where they should look at me when I demonstrate an exercise, but then when I give a lecture or when they follow the exercise and they understood it, to cover the computer, to not even look at the computer, but to do the exercise. And so my preference is you look at a distance. I'll never forget that once I had a guy who came to me who was macular degeneration. And he was 73. Now, you know, uh, Eric, uh, I will tell your age against your will. You're 76, and you look like you are uh, something like 25. Let's put it this way. I mean, you're really in fantastic shape. Uh, but um, uh, I thought he was old because I was 28, and he was 73. Time changed. You know, I'm getting closer to his age. I'm uh, almost 67. And by the way, I'm driving more than 38 years. I mean, I used to be in such vision that my parents, my parents, by the way, were deaf. It's interesting. I was known in the deaf community until now. They know about me. I was the blind kids of Ida and Abraham in Tel Aviv. Everybody knew I was deaf. I was blind. And in fact, one time when I did eye exercises and one neighbor saw that I'm seeing you, she said, how come you're seeing? You're supposed to be the blind. So it's not like 
she was happy I'm sitting. Uh, I kind of violated her space. I was the supposedly the blind person in that street, you know? And so I was known as that. And um, now I'm celebrating that um, uh, in August of, um, of uh, last year, uh, I got, uh, uh, I got a driver's license for five more years until 2025. <laughs> and by then I'll be driving quite a few years, I think 43 years or something like this. Uh, so that's a big deal for me, with the eye that you've seen, you know. So the big deal is <clears throat> that for me, as for him, for L, the guy who had macular degeneration, uh, when I met him, he saw eight images of everything, and his vision was 2400. That means they wouldn't see this be from 20 feet, you would see it from 10 feet. And that would have been fuzzy, and it would have uh, been eight times. It was terrible. And as we did the work, I asked him, what have you done most of your adult life? And he said, I was looking at medicine bubbles, and I was looking at prescriptions uh, that the doctors gave, because he was a pharmacist. I said, San Francisco is beautiful. We've done many other exercises, but I said, look at the distance. And that was for two hours a day. He did. And biologically, what, why should, I mean, can you explain what happens to the eyes, the convergence and the, the tightening of the ciliary muscles when you look nearby versus what happens when you're looking for a moment far away? Well, to begin with, you become more nearsighted when you look from near, right? But uh, to continue with, it is such a strain on the eyes. Well, I want all of you, put your hand right here on your nose. Look at your lifeline. You know, this close, yeah? Look at it. Now look at the distance out of the window. And again, look at your nose. And then look at and I really feel that tension building up automatically. And look how easy, how easy it is to look at a distance. So it freed his eyes. I mean, we all need to do opposite of what we did. For example, as the people sit a lot on chairs, right? One thing I tell them, you stand up, you hold your leg, and you stretch it backwards. You stand up, you hold your leg, and you stretch it backwards like this. And you push your chest forwards so the neck even falls back. That way, you do the opposite of sitting. Because sitting, slouching, is stress on the body. Same thing with the eyes. If you look a lot for me, well, with our ancestors, looking for two million dollars, two million years, sorry, at the distance, hunting. Only the last 10,000 years they're farmers, but even then they didn't have satellites to look at the distance, to see cloud movements, to see if a storm is coming. Well, what happens now is that we look so much from near that we are losing a lot of vision. We become myopic in the younger age, and when you become in your 40s, normally become press bio, and they don't even think it's a problem. They'll give you glasses to read with, but they don't believe in your ability to get rid of your readers. Which, by the way, I'm going to do just now a workshop, getting rid of your readers, and it's going to be a regular video that I'm going to have. So uh, the point is, what's important for me is to explain that looking at details, and differently than what you used to do, is the beginning of fear. It's a relief. So as he looked at details, he gained back vision from 5% to 95% vision. It was amazing. Uh, with, without glasses, he saw 2100, which is 40%. But with glasses, he saw 2025, and it was not correctable before we worked. It was three months. He also was stooped. So I straightened his, his back, and we did wonderful exercises to loosen up his shoulders. But then looking at the distance and doing the different exercises made a difference. So let me just repeat this. Looking at details, not missing details. Looking from detail to detail. Because we lost so much curiosity, looking with curiosity. Another thing that I suggest to people is to look at details with the eye they normally don't use. So if, for example, you mainly use your left eye, look with your right eye at details. So 
you touch or you put a, uh, a glasses with obstruction over your left eye, and vice versa, you do with your right eye. You As the mayor, obstruction. how would I know? I have two questions. Let me make a comment. One, just a reminder that by looking at the distance, what is really happening is the eyes diverge, so now the muscles relax, and the, the ciliary muscle around the lens relaxes, so it reduces the pressure, the strain around the eyes. And what you said earlier about glaucoma, at least for high tension glaucoma, when there's strain around the eyes, it's possible it would constrict the von Schlem canals, which would avoid draining the eye, so eye pressure could go up. That's one. The, you know, and now the question I would ask you is, how would I know which eye is dominant? Well, uh, or dominant or strong, right? So it's very easy. You know yourself, of course. And that is uh, that uh, if you will look uh, with your eyes like this, you close one eye, close the other eye, you see with which eye you're seeing through the hole that you're looking with. There's another way of knowing it. And this is that if you um, look at the eye chart um, and you will close, you will look, let's say, at this line and you will close one eye and close the other eye you see which eye sees that line better. And then you'll know which eye you want to cover. I remember that I used to um, cover my kids' eyes uh, when I was taking them to school. But now if any of my kids drives me, I cover my eye to look with my weaker eye. It gives me such a great release. Which comes to the next point that I want to say we need to increase our peripheral vision. And we need to create balance use between the two eyes. That is so important because quite often one eye overpowers another eye. And then the next principle is balance use. Wait, 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 wait. Can, you know, you're talking about peripheral vision, you know, and I think you're, it makes total sense as I know what the word. From an evolutionary perspective, we were outside in the, wherever we were, and we would look far ahead, but we'd also need to be aware of the periphery. And if it weren't, we would be lunch for the, for the predators. However, today we mainly don't use our periphery anymore, which you can see when people look at their cell phones, they only focus on the cell phone and we see this massive increase in pedestrian deaths, for example, or, or accidents, because people are totally unaware of what's happening. So what is the harm of that? And second, can you guide us through an exercise to, to increase our peripheral vision. Absolutely. So I want to reinforce what you said. I stood once um, in a, a coffee shop before I was about to give a lecture in the, the San Francisco branch library in West Port. And uh, I was standing near a lady who was looking at her phone. I was standing basically half a foot away from her. And she was waiting for a turn to order. And then it was turn to order. And I said, are you noticing me? I'm standing right near you. And she said, no. Well, okay. I said to her, I stood that way for five minutes. You didn't pay attention. She said, no, I was looking at my phone. And I said to her, now you're giving me good material for the class I'm going to teach. Can you imagine somebody sitting and looking at her phone? in the jungle and not paying, paying any attention to what's around her. As you said, she'd be eaten very quickly. That is so normal. That is what happened in these days. And people really have to understand that careless about the visual function, careless about the visual function, if they do it that way. How do we expand our periphery? With movement. So when we do it as a mayor, would you be willing to guide us through the exercise, maybe let us look at something and then do the exercise and see if vision can improve, even if you just look at it at a regular piece of paper or text? Right. So are you talking about peripheral vision or something else? No, no, about the peripheral vision. Possibly yeah. if, as the person who's watching now, maybe look at your textbook or some printed page, just hold it at a distance, see how clearly you can see that. Okay, very good. Um, and now, and after you've looked at that page, now follow Mayer's uh, exercises peripheral vision. Perfect. 
So uh, with the peripheral vision exercises, and as usual, I'm not finding one thing. I found it. Okay. Um, here's what I want you to do when you're at home. Please cut yourself four pieces of paper. One small, one which I would call medium, um, one which I would call uh, large, and one which I would call extra large. And see if you can quickly cut those pieces of paper. And I can tell you that whenever I went to Eric's classes, um, when uh, the world was more open, uh, we used to work with those four pieces of paper, or sometimes we only did two, in the class. But um, uh, so what I suggest is, are people watching this at home or in the class, this interview? They'll be watching it at home. Okay. They can pause it right so, now. So, so stop right now the interview for the next three minutes and cut yourself four pieces of paper. Again, um, one which is small, one which is medium, one which is large, and one which is extra large, okay? After you cut the, the paper, um, what you can... Um, get is masking tapes, okay? So what you do is you take masking tape and you basically make a circle with the masking tape. And in that circle, you will um, glue on the paper and on your nose. So you can glue it on the paper and on your nose. But he, he, but he, but yeah. So what you're doing is you're taking a small piece of masking tape, or even you could even do scotch tape if that's all you have, make a little loop with the sticky side on the outside. So the sticky side will go against the paper, and then the other part of that loop would be able to go against your skin. You would put it there, and it would just stay there. Exactly. Like this. Okay. Great. So I'm showing you my, because I'm putting them on my shirt. Um, the four size paper that I want you all to have. Okay? The four size paper that I want you all to have. We have more than one use for each paper. As you can see a lot of masking tapes here, but the main thing is that you put masking tape in the middle and you have small, medium, large, extra large. So basically you can see the sizes I'm suggesting and you put it together. Now turn the uh, program off and then put it back on once you finish doing that. Okay. So now, <clears throat> once you came back, wave your hands to the side. Why waving the hands? Because you will uh, uh, look straight, but as you wave the hands, more things will be noticed by your periphery you will sense more the sides, the walls, the, the ceiling, the floor. Uh, you will sense everything around you. So as you wave your hands, you sense it all. So as I'm waving, basically, I'm still sort of looking straight ahead, but I feel, I see, I get a sense of my hands moving at the periphery. Exactly, exactly. It's not that I'm following my hands with my eyes. No, I'm not looking at my hands. That's another exercise, nothing wrong with that. But that's not what I'm doing. Now, I'm, uh, uh, before that, I'm gonna cover one eye and move my hand to the side as I'm looking straight. Move my hand to the side as I'm looking straight. And I'm trying to actually avoid the screen so I will not see the hand on the screen, it makes no sense. I'm looking at something and moving my hand in both sides. And I'll do the same thing here. I'm looking and waving my hand and moving my hand in both sides. And I'm waving my hands. So now I'm putting the paper between my eyes. What I'm doing is I'm disturbing my central vision. This is something you should do a lot. After typing or something, put a small paper between your eyes. Look straight at the paper, and then you really disturb your central vision 
and you're opening up your periphery. So we wave, and we wave, and we wave, and we wave. And we have a good sense of the periphery. And now I'm going to exchange it with a medium piece of paper. And I wave and wave and wave and wave. And I'm going to look at an even bigger piece of paper and wave and wave. And wave and wave. And now I'll be looking with the largest piece of paper and I'll keep waving. But I'll be looking straight, I'll wave below, I'll wave above, I'll wave to the side, I'll wipe my hands now and I will palm. I put my hands very gently around my orbits and I will relax my arm. And now I'll wave my hands again to the side above and below. I will put the next piece of paper here. Okay. I will put what I call the medium size and I will wave my hands around and I can wave near the face, middle size, far away. And I'll put the small piece of paper. If the small piece of paper feels smaller to you right now, it means that your periphery is grown. And that is very, very priceless. Now, uh, since Eric said, uh, take a look at how you saw the page, look now at the distance, look at the distance, and um, look uh, at uh, leaves or anything of that nature. Now take the small piece of paper, put the masking tape on the side, and if you know that you have one stronger eye, cover the weaker, uh, the stronger eye, wave your hand to the side, and with the weaker eye, look at details, look at leaves, look at the sky, look at clouds, and then take the paper off and look at them. Same thing we're doing with reading. Now, one thing that you should know, though, I met enough people, I would say about 30% of people, that one eye drives and one eye reads. So what you do, in my case, is the same eyes, the right eye. You cover the stronger eye, you wave with your weaker eye, it's to the side of the weaker eye, and you read the page. And you read any page that you want, this is the page that we have, which you could easily copy from our... So I'm just using regular page for a moment at a distance. Yeah, yeah. And you read that page, and it doesn't matter how well you see. If you don't see well, you can read this, this page. If you see better, you can read this page. Most of you saw seven and eight pretty easily. And so you read that page. You close your eyes and you say, the ink is black, the page is white. Ink is black, the page is white. Ink is black, the page is white. The ink, ink is black, is black the page, page is, white. is white. You take the paper off, and now you look. And you can see that so, uh, most people see that some letters became clearer. I not like to do this exercise in the sun. You have to see that I'm taking um, uh, people at Eric's class, but uh, they don't look as wacko as the people who I take to the beach right near my school. You know, all of a sudden, very fast, I'm walking to the school, putting paper, waving, putting glasses of obstruction and throwing balls to each other. We're doing all that but it does lead to much better vision. And this is the thing I want you to know, vision can improve. So uh, to just repeat the principle is relaxation, adaptation to different light frequencies, uh, looking at details, looking at the distance. Very important to look at the distance, we don't look enough at the distance. Peripheral expansion, balance use of the eyes, balance use within each eye. We have an exercise, but we put an eye patch and then put a, a little uh, strip of paper in one eye and throw both from side to side to create balance use within that eye. And then body and eye coordination. There was one guy who lost 85% of his field of vision, he had an elective surgery of the heart. It's very hard sometimes when you 
we do a surgery and either we die there or, uh, or something happens. If you don't need the surgery, think twice before taking it. He didn't need it, he was proposed it, he took it, he got a stroke of supportive nerve. And he came to me and I got him to bounce on the trampoline. And the way he would bounce, um, he would um, bounce forwards or bounce backwards, would land on his bum, would go like this. And it's always uh, errors that I've shown him. When I finished with him, his vision became 85%. His peripheral vision had improved dramatically. So body and eye coordination are important. We become stiff and we start to read and we slouch and we have to change it. There was one lady who came to me who was a hunchback. And when I straightened her back, she saw better. So you have Mayor, to put the body on the eyes. Mayor, as we have been sitting now for quite a while, would you mind guiding us through one little practice where we experience some looseness or something like that? Yes, I can. So we started with the neck. Let's continue with the neck. And that is that... Um, <clears throat> uh, Remember, we move the head in rotating motion in both directions. And we can feel the tension in our neck. We can kind of massage the neck, like, you know, squeeze the muscles, work on them, squeeze the muscles, squeeze this area. It, it separate the scalp from the scalp, move the head in rotating motion. And um, one of the things we can do is can move the whole body in rotating motion in both directions. And remember what we did the top here, the top here, we say center, center, center. So we center, center, thigh, center, center thigh, and we stand. And sit. And again, center thigh, center thigh, center thigh, ten. And then sit. And see how the neck feels. Does that feel looser? So that's a nice feeling. And uh, <clears throat> what, there are many more exercises, of course. You can get them. I have 600 exercises in the book, Awakening Your Power of self healing But I repeated this one I did originally because it's so easy to do. Um, the last principle is the one I talked about, more blood to the visual system. If you do all that, if you look at a distance, pay attention to the periphery, look at details, um, rest your eyes. And maybe the last one, we should rest our eyes with the palming exercise. You can improve your vision. This is the big thing. You can improve your vision. You know, the, I remember that uh, in the past, uh, you were subject to medical board investigation if you claim that eyes can improve. You know, Margaret Corbett was a student of Dr. Bates, and she was taken to court by the state of California. But she was acquitted, and the jurors came to her as uh, students to her classes. And she was the teacher of Aldous Huxley, who was a very known English writer. And um, what happens now? We have a conference of natural vision improvement virtual. There was one in the Spanish language with 22,000 people. And now I don't know how many she'll get, but already she got 7,000 people worldwide who are looking at it. And it could end up being 8,000 people. So we'll have 30,000 people worldwide who believe that eyes can improve. And it's about time for this to penetrate to the medical profession. My friend- Well, the way, yes. The way I would say it, in a, in a, and that applies not just to the eyes, to the whole body, function develops structure, and structure limits function. And so by changing how you're using yourself, you can slowly change your structure. We know that sort of even with our muscles, if we work out, we, our muscles get stronger. If we don't work out certain ways, our muscles get weaker. You can even see this in people who are much more elderly, who are using wheelchairs, or walkers, if they're often a number of people who use walkers, if you really teach them a strategy to, to develop strength again, a number of them can put the walkers to the side. So there's possibilities of growth at all levels. And if, and the point you're, you're making- You're the best example. You're the best example of this, but I would like to add to what you said, which is completely true. 
function affects structure and thought affects function. And, yes. and the belief that you can improve is very important because it helps everything. And I think that uh, your teacher, by the way, I really, really admire uh, Eric, who's interviewing me now. And, uh, and what I want to say is that uh, your teacher basically worked with many people whose beliefs made a big difference in what they succeeded to do with themselves. So in my case, where I was supposed to read Braille for the rest of my life, and now I drive, you know, uh, although people are laughing at me saying that bumps on the roads are Braille for blind drivers, I haven't improved my vision to 100%. It's about 70% of normal vision, but I'm able to function with it. And the reason is the commitment, the commitment to make a difference. And look what happened to your teacher, Eric, who committed himself to do better in life and in which shape he is at the age of 76, how bright and brilliant and thoughtful he is. And uh, he never lost curiosity. He has the child from within. He always wants to learn. He always wants to absorb. He just finished writing a fantastic book that the whole, world, the whole world should know about. And so what I want to say is that it really depends on your willingness to accept. Now, I think it's a very miserable situation that the medical profession does not accept that eyes can get better. When neurologists don't accept that you can get easily out of, not easily, but you can get out of paralysis. If we accepted that, we would be able to get rid of many problems that we have. And some of you... Oh, but I would agree. I agree with you. We don't. I think the reality is we never quite know what the future totally holds. But the limits of beliefs really constrain what the limits of experience can be. So if your belief is more open-ended and have possibilities, then who knows how many possibilities there are? And I think you are the living example of that with your own vision. That in a way you did not accept those words. And the piece I really commend you on. I mean in awe, which most people don't quite see, is that you just didn't practice for five minutes a day or 10 minutes a day. You practice hours and hours. And in that sense, what you did for yourself, if your vision is very similar, what many athletes do, you know, an af a good athlete doesn't practice for 15 minutes and now is skilled, you know, they may spend months, years practicing in running to gain a few seconds. Isn't that something? No. But let's say something else there. Abraham Maslow said that anybody who breaks Olympic records breaks it not just for himself, for herself, but for all of us. Yes. Do you remember years ago, there was the first person who could do four miles in, I mean, one mile in four minutes. Bannister. <laughs> I'm far away from being able to do that. But after that person, other people broke it and did a few seconds ahead of it. But if we go back to what we can do with the eyes, you see, these days, because of the use of the computer, more and more people lose their vision. And so it is very important for us to influence ourselves, like the 100 monkeys, you know, that, you know the 100 monkeys in one island knew, learn how to peel bananas and talk it to each other. Another island where they didn't meet them, they start to do the same thing. And I feel that there is transmission from one person to another with millions of cells in our brain that allow transmission to other people, but also our actions. If you now have glasses, a new work on getting better and seeing better, putting your glasses in your pocket most of the time and using them when you need them, and then slowly reducing the prescription. I'm not saying anybody throw away, but reduce the prescription, improve your vision, see better, when you improve your vision, you don't only improve it for yourself, you improve it for others too, because people are influenced by each other. And that's the reason why it's so important for me that you have such a wonderful teacher in State University that is open to so much more. I'll give you one wonderful example. There was a wonderful lady at the age of 18 who came to me <clears throat> and reported that she's blind in the right eye but has only 20% vision in the left eye, so she's legally blind there. 
And as I was sitting and chatting with her, we looked at the chart and she actually saw 40% vision. But the mother said, we went to all the big specialists in Canada, they came to me from Alberta. And none of them saw her seeing so well. I said, well, she's relaxed with me. She wasn't relaxed with them. Then we went to a dark room. I patched very heavily the left eye with two patches and masking tape around. And I had light blinking. I wasn't surprised that she saw the light because she told me that she sees light, nothing else. But as the light kept blinking, she started to see the lamp. And three minutes later, she saw shadows. And within five minutes, she could see my face. She could see everybody in the room. And I said, well, this is amazing. So apparently the right eye was not really blind, it was lazy. What does it mean by that? The brain didn't connect to it. And as the light was blinking, the brain connected to it. So we got her to the trampoline, got her to bounce on the trampoline, got her to walk looking with that eye. The next year they came to work on eye teaming, getting the two eyes to work together. We have wonderful exercises that Eric probably knows a lot about with red and green glasses, red and blue glasses exist too. I need to find them here, but um, uh, what a mess. But I would say we have the red and green glasses. And when people wear those glasses, they create a real good division of the two eyes and get the two eyes to work better. So from uh, putting this on and uh, from uh, patching and from putting this on, we also had red and green glasses that lead to one I sees one sort of colors, the other eye sees another colors, and then you fuse them together in the brain. So we've done it with her, and we fused everything in the brain with her, and she ended up seeing so much better than she saw originally. I got her to see 40% just talking to me, but we finished with her seeing 70%, and one eye that was legally blind still helped the other eye. Now here's an example. And her mother started to say, you know what? I'm too protective of my daughter. Uh, I always think she doesn't see, but she sees better than I think. So this is a good example, how you break the concept of what you can see for yourself, for your parents, for others, and how you can create new vision for yourself. Mayor, so very much. Yeah. Mayor, I'm so impressed each time and so difficult at times to do online, how many of these practices and skills you have developed can help people coordinate their eyes, but it's really the whole body coordination. But to end basically, because so many of us overuse our eyes in a sense without ever allowing it to relax. It's like holding a muscle, your arm up all the time. It doesn't get enough blood flow. And so you need to have it regenerate. I wonder if you could end by sharing a, a, a technique which you start to talk about called palming, because that is such a useful tool we can all do and explain this in detail if possible. To do the palming, you use a palming stick, and what is the purpose of that? So, when we palm, when we palm, we should not, um, we should not put our um, hands in such a way that the neck either move forwards or backwards. So we want the neck to be straight. So at home, you can put a bunch of pillows. What's great about this? I can make it go up, I can make it go down. So before I palm, I'm moving my arms in rotating motion in both directions, and I'm moving it like this as well. I'm rubbing my hands. It's good to wash the hands before we do that, because- And just as, and just as a side note, I don't have a palming stick at my house, but what I do on my desk is have two stacks of books. And so I make these books high enough so I can just rest my elbows on both stocks of the books. So then I can just let my head go forward just like this. And I don't apply much pressure to my cheeks. That's going to change uh, rather soon. We're going to send you a palm instead. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, what I, what I want to say is this. Make sure that Rosando knows your, your uh, address so we can mail it to you. But... Um, uh, I, I like palming stick, and what uh, Eric is saying is perfectly correct. And this is that um, uh, you can put books, you can put pillows, books are better. And the point is this, 
There are a few no-nos. Never put pressure on the cheekbones. Never lift your shoulders high. And breathe deeply and slowly. So I want all of you to darken your room. Darken your room. As you do it, I have dark rooms. In fact, I'll even darken this room to the extent that I can, basically. And your hands have to be soft and nourishing. It's not simply that you are covering the eyes. You're, you're putting the hands on your cheekbones. You're covering the forehead, but it's not that point. The main point is you're nourishing your eyes. So focus on your breathing as you sit down now and calm. And feel how your abdomen expands as you inhale and shrinks as you exhale. And feel how your ribs expand as you breathe in and shrink as you breathe out. And feel how your head expands as you breathe in and shrinks as you breathe out. And feel how your legs in your mind, can expand and shrink. Your feet can expand and shrink. Your eyes can expand and shrink. Feel that the whole body becomes larger when you breathe in and smaller when you breathe out. So you breathe in and you breathe out and you feel like your whole body expands and shrinks. And I will play some music so you can listen to music. The most important thing is you don't want to think. So, Mayor, in this yeah. practice, this is both a visual practice where basically you let the eyes relax. You feel almost the healing warmth and energy going into the eyes. But all, and also it's a meditative practice of mindfulness in a certain way where you're just focusing on, on the block in a sense you can see. And if thoughts come by, you just let them go. You don't follow the thoughts and keep just being present with the awareness of the warmth around your eyes. With that. Absolutely. And, then, and then continue the very slow breathing. Exactly. So you and can I, count four when you inhale and six or seven when you exhale. How long should a person do this each time? Minimum six minutes. And the maximum depends on your body. The best I've done was 11 hours in one sitting. And that's crazy. But then after that, I got my driver's license. Yeah? Uh, but I would say maximum 40 minutes because most people cannot be relaxed enough to sit longer than that. But, but at least for, six minutes at a time, it's great. So at least in the beginning, do it for six minutes. And then, you know, you remember, you can keep looking at the far distance. I think people can keep doing this. But let me make a few comments as we're going. I'm so impressed, Mayor, by your practices, because basically you have truly embedded, from my perspective, an evolutionary perspective. You really have to... Un have to ask how do how did people really see how were the work the eyes working through evolution how did it develop and that was always looking far distance near distance awareness to periphery alternating and looking not looking and then implicitly you have asked how are we using our eyes now and how far are we removed from those natural almost patterns of looking and then you develop such a remarkable series of practices to, to have people re-establish these I mean, early ways how which evolutionary patterns to optimize vision and whether that's looking at detail at the distance whether it's periphery awareness whether it's both eyes working together and i'm just looking in awe. at details and looking at details right yes. and 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 breathing and doing, and I know this is only a small part of the many concepts you have developed that you have also applied to neurological disorders, but I have been truly impressed how when people apply these tech, this approach, this evolutionary based, re-accepting almost and reincorporating how we see optimally through evolution, 
that all of a sudden some of the disorders we have can be reversed and some of the disorders may be prevented. And I think to me that, and I know your books are just truly remarkable that they contain these concepts described in detail. And I should tell you, by the way, that in the book we wrote, in fact, I borrowed and, you know, hopefully with the appropriate credit, a number of your concepts to optimize people to be healthy. You know, I really want to say that the tech stress is a fantastic book that people should read. If you are intrigued in how to enhance vision and neuromuscular, neuro, neuro neurocoordinational patterns or have disorders in that, Mayer's books are remarkably pragmatic, offer a background that I highly recommend, especially his book, Vision for Life. They're just remarkable. And Mayer, I wanna really thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom to the class. Although it's only a small part, and I know that when people practice these skills, which is really an evolutionary perspective to re allow your own self-healing potential to come to the foreground, vision is improved. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for, so much for the amazing work you're doing. And I hope that your students are grateful to you and know what a teacher they have. Thanks. And, and if anyone is intrigued, the mayor's school is in San Francisco. It's a school for self-healing.